the gift. Last week we talked about the gift needed. We talked about the original sin of Adam and Eve and the, and the sin nature that came upon us because of that and the spiritual death uh, that comes to all people as a result of that sin nature. And so we, we talked about the need of a Savior because uh, quite honestly and quite literally we can't save ourselves. We need somebody else to save us and so God is providing a Savior for us through the Messiah, Jesus Christ. How many of you are glad about that? Amen, I like that. Okay, thank you for that one person that clapped too. Uh, in, this, in this week's sermon uh, on, on the gift, we're going to talk about the gift uh, revealed. Now, there, there's, most of you out there are, are, are smarter than me, but uh, if, if I was to say, uh, if I was to list a hundred things predicting what a person was going to do or what he was going to be or he, she or was going to be like a hundred things. If I was to predict a hundred, let's say you got a grandbaby that's just got born and I was going to predict a hundred things that he or she would do in their lifetime to get all hundred of those right, let me get this right, it would be 200 billion earths full of people to come up with one person who would fully uh, fulfill those prophecies. Kind of blows your mind, doesn't it? I'm not real good at math, but that sounds like an awful lot. In fact, it just kind of borderlines on impossible, amen? And so uh, it kind of blows my mind too. But Old, Old Testament uh, scriptures don't just record 100 prophecies about Jesus. It records 300. 300 separate prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus would have to fulfill to perfection for him to be qualified to be the Messiah, the promised Savior of the world. Does anybody think that's amazing? <laughs> so, by man's standards, a hundred prophecies are impossible, much less three times that amount. I mean, that's why Satan works so hard to discredit the Bible, uh, because he knows that he can't discredit all the prophecies, and so he tries to discredit the, the Word of God, tells, uh, says that it's, it's not real, says that uh, the people didn't know what they were doing. Some people say that Isaiah didn't write, really write the book, but instead it was written after all these things happened. But I'm going to tell you, even secular historians say that's, that's foolishness. Uh, even secular historians talk about the validity of the Old Testament, certainly the New Testament. So the book of Isaiah we're going to look at today uh, records many, many, many prophecies, and we're going to look at four uh, this morning. It's one of the best places in the Old Testament to see Jesus revealed. And sometimes, I, I, I read this not long ago, it's sometimes called the fifth gospel because it's filled with so much stuff of what Jesus was going to do that was fulfilled perfectly. So we're going to be in the book of Isaiah. If you can't keep up with turning the pages, look on the screen. My good friend Mark will make sure uh, that it's up there for you. Uh, but in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 2, the Bible says, See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the people's but the Lord rises among you, and his glory appears over you. And some translations say, is revealed to you. So let's pray. Father, we give you this time in the name of the Lord. Lord, I, I don't know what you're going to do with this sermon, Lord, because um, I, I, without you, I have nothing to give. But Lord, I pray that you would just put words in my mouth that would just uh, uh, flow over this place, Lord, and your Holy Spirit would do what he does best. And Lord, I just pray that you would be in control of this service in Christ's name. Amen. Now, when you look at verse 2 of chapter of uh, 60 of Isaiah, it really tells the story of where earth is. Once Adam and Eve uh, sinned in the garden and they were kicked out and they had uh, guards on the entrances there with flaming swords to keep them back from coming back in, darkness and gloom uh, covered over the earth. But praise God, now... Uh, some 700 years before Christ, Isaiah is giving us a prophecy, a glimpse, a foreknowledge of what God was going to do. So this book, written 700 years before Christ, and, 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 and we should wonder and we should worship of how, how good God is. Because here's the deal, and, and this is in my notes, I'm going to say this quickly. God wanted so much for you to believe that Christ was real that he put all these prophecies in here that would be impossible for a man to be able to do. To, feel, to fulfill all those prophecies would be 
impossible. How many of you know that God's good at the impossible? Listen, I, I, I forgot to mention this, but it goes right along with what we're talking about. We did a deal called, uh, Tyler and the youth did a deal yesterday called Ray Day, Rent a Youth Day, and had nearly 30 people show up for that, and went to different people's house and different ones, and they had a blast. Brother Vernon here said, hey, would you be sure and tell those kids that we really appreciate all the work? Can you just imagine how cool that is for young people to connect with senior adults and love on them? Isn't God good? That's almost a miracle in itself, amen? <laughs> So anyway, quickly, we're going to look at four passages that reveal the coming Savior. Uh, first, we're going to look at chapter 7 of the book of Isaiah, and we see a sure sign. Now, when we come to this chapter 7 of Isaiah, there, at that particular time, there's an evil king named Ahaz that's on the throne. He had deliberately disobeyed God, and as a result, his kingdom was under attack from all sides. But in the midst of all that gloom and doom and despair is when God revealed the answers to not only his problem, to only the people of, of that particular time, but the problem of all eternity was revealed by, uh, the answer to the problem of all reality was revealed in chapter 7, verse 14. Verse 14, you'll recognize this. It says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Not the people, not somebody else, but the Lord himself. And it says, a virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And then, listen, that's pretty, that's, that's amazing in itself when it says that the Lord himself will give you a sign. Listen, he didn't send the angel. He didn't send somebody else. The Lord himself spoke into Isaiah's heart and says, I'll give him, I'm going to give you a sign here. You need to listen up. And it says that God himself will provide life. It reminds me of back when Abraham brought his son Isaac and they went up on the hill on the way up to the hill where he's going to sacrifice his son. You remember the story? And, and, uh, and, and, and Isaac says, well, I see the fire and I see all this. But, but where's, the, where's, the, uh, where's the sacrifice? And he says then, he said, God, Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb. And God himself tells us right here in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, that God himself is going to be able to give you that sacrificial lamb. Notice that the sign uh, will be that the son will be born to a virgin. In the commentary, it says in the Hebrew that there's uh, emphasis on those words, be, and it's like this, so a couple of years, but behold, the virgin will be with child. Listen, that's a mouthful. We, I mean, we take it for granted because we hear about it every Christmas, can, but you know, I promise you that it's not like that TV show where Mary the Virgin, uh, whatever that girl's name is, Jane the Virgin. All of you sinners knew what that was. Just kidding. <laughs> oh, is that you, Mark? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean. I, I didn't know it was you, man. <laughs> well, I stand corrected. <laughs> it comes on sometime. Man. But listen, God Himself wanted to make so so sure that you knew that it was God in the flesh that he that that she didn't even she wasn't with a man. Mary wasn't with a man. But all of a sudden she became pregnant. How through the Holy Spirit, so that we would know that this God, uh, that this that this Messiah, this sacrifice, this Redeemer had come from God to us he gave he he gave him in the form of a human baby through mary to make sure that we also knew that he was completely human he was completely deity completely god and he was also completely human and completely man so that he would know and feel and realize what we go through every day because he was dying for us Whew. how good is that guys a virgin will be with child and give birth to a son and then it says that the Son would be God incarnate. What does incarnate mean? It means God in the flesh. The name Emmanuel means God with us. In fact, some commentaries say that, that, that it means the strong God will be with us. Come on, I'm saying God twice, right? While, while Jesus, while, while this Emmanuel was not Jesus' proper name, it was a name that belonged to him as an attribute of God. And this is who he is. I mean, from this miraculous birth on, God himself would be present in earthly form among the people to the day uh, that he was hung on the cross and died. Matthew chapter 1 verse 22 says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, deacon. That there is a good example of a deacon. You guys, you other guys need to watch. 
All right, so I've insulted Mark and I've insulted the rest of the deacon team. Yours is on the way. <laughs> Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Isaiah, <laughs> sometimes we're just stupid, aren't we? Um, in Isaiah 9, the Bible talks about a sent son. Not only a sure sign, but a sent son. Let's quickly move over to that passage. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he, God, humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor, watch this, you'll know this name, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. Now, these two cities it talks about, Zebulun and Naphtali, they're tribes in the north of Israel that make up the land now that we know as the Galilee region. For many years, the people of this region, they only knew grief and despair because of all the bad things that were happening. These, these armies would come in from the north, and the first ones they got to was the people of, of, uh, of Zebulun and Naphtali, and they took the first brunt every time. I mean, it was a bad time for them. But Isaiah tells of a time in the future where this gloom is, is going to be replaced with gladness in Galilee. I mean, don't miss the fact that the ministry of Jesus was grounded right there in that Galilee region. So many of his miracles and his great things happened right there in the Sermon on the Mount, right there in that area. I mean, all, all of these miracles, not all of them, but a lot of these miracles happened right there in that, in that area. Can I just tell you that I get excited? When I read this 9-1, I'll I be honest with you, I wasn't so familiar with that passage, but when I look at that and I think about the Savior revealed, there was a time before that that the people of Israel had no hope. They were desperate and no way to know or to get to God. Just, just kind of going through the dark. But when Isaiah comes to us here in Isaiah chapter 9, he reveals to us a Savior who would come and there'd be no more uh, gloom and there'd be a way for us no matter how time, uh, bad times get. Now, <clears throat> Christmas um, is, it was, and certainly is now birthed in the midst of great grief. And we think about all the good things about Christmas, all the gifts, all the other things, but you think about it, uh, while the angels were proclaiming peace on earth, goodwill toward men, Herod was preparing to annihilate infants, right? While, while Mary was worshiping, other mothers were weeping for their children. I mean, look at Jeremiah. You don't have to look at it now, but if you're taking notes, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15, it prophesies that. Matthew chapter 2, verse 16 tells about it. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, though, describes how the birth of Jesus would bring brightness into a dark world. It says this, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on, the live, on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. It kind of like, guys, when you're going through your life and, and you don't see the need for salvation, and then all of a sudden you're here at a service, you're at VBS, or you're at home with your parents, or something happens, and all of a sudden this light bulb comes on, and you go, you know what? I need a Savior. In your dark world, the Savior shows up and brings life to you. John 8, 12 says, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. You could say way truth and life. I'd be okay with that. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I want to show you something, show you something real quick about this. Whoever follows me, talking about God, talking about Jesus, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I've heard people say, well, Johnny, I've walked through a lot of darkness. What does that mean? There's some people that are in darkness all the time. It just seems like they stay in one dark place all the time. I want you to watch this verse. Walking connotates or denotes that we're going from one place to another. And I can just tell you, how many know that with God, there is always light at the end of the tunnel? No matter how bad it is. No matter how dark the day may seem, if you look, you'll see the light of the Father because where the Father is, there is light. Now, on down to chapter 9, verse 6, you'll recognize this. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I, I, I don't have time to go into each one of those separately. But I'm going to tell you what, do a study on each one of those words and you will be uplifted. And he goes on to say, uh, of, of the increase of his government, peace uh, and peace, there will be no end. 
he will reign on David's throne. He was of the, of the lineage of David and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And then he uses this cool word, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. What does that zeal mean? It means that he's excited about something. I got zeal for that. I am excited about that. Listen, when I have a chance to go into that baptismal water, thank you, Lauren, you did so good this morning. She's so tiny, I just kind of put her down there and brought her right back up. She's so little. Last week I had a little boy. Their parents paid me to hold him under longer, but I didn't. God's good. And God has a zeal for you. He, he loves you so much that he don't want you to live in darkness. He don't want you to walk in darkness. And so he made it perfect so that he could reveal the way of the world. Our way of escape, our way that we can reach heaven was revealed to us right here in Isaiah chapter 9. Now, this phrase to us, for, un, for to us, and in, in, in other places is unto us, but this phrase to us means actually for us, and it means for our benefit, says in the commentaries. And the emphasis is on the child. The baby was given not for God's uh, benefit, but for our benefit. He does this because he loves us. Uh, for us, a child is born, describes that his birth would be as a baby. Uh, to us, a son is given. God is, Jesus is God's redemption given as a gift. I mean, this child that we see birthed in Bethlehem, and, and certainly I don't have time to get into that prophecy, but it was even prophesied. Um, <coughs> Bethlehem, Ephrathah, it made, made, made sure you knew exactly the, right, the, the, the place where he'd be born. Uh, this means that, that all the expectations of the throne would be given to Jesus. I mean, again, if you're taking notes, I'll give you some of my stuff here, but 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 13 through 16 talks about that. I mean, this baby that was born and laid on a bed of straw inside of a cattle trough was going to be the Savior, the Redeemer of the world to all who would call upon his name. I mean, it's amazing to me that Isaiah not only knew that Emmanuel would be born to a virgin as a sure sign, but he also understood, Isaiah understood, 700 years before Christ, that he would be a sent son. I mean, you think about what Gabriel said to Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 32. It says, he will be great. Is he great? Is Jesus great? He'd be called the son of the most high. Does he fill that bill? The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. He's a sure sign. He's a sent son. And then thirdly, we see in, the, in Isaiah chapter 11, and I, I, you're going to like this, this, uh, this point here, a shoot from a stump. A shoot from a stump. What do you mean, Pastor? Here, let's look at it. Isaiah 11, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 1. It says it. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he'll give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Now, Jesus is all of that, but the one that I, I only have time to point out one here, and, and it's this. Uh, the, at the very end, it says, with, his, with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. I mean, think about how many times in, 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 the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, where it talks about Jesus coming up against the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day, kings, uh, rulers, and putting them down. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Another prophecy. And we found it come completely true. Now, what's it talking about when it talks about a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse? Well, we know that Jesse is the father of David. You remember that story where, uh, where, where the prophet came to the, the house of Jesse because God said that's where the next king will come from? And all the different sons went by and none of them were the right one. He said, would you have any more sons? And and Jesse said, well, my, I got a little small son. He's out there taking care of the sheep. Well, bring him. And that was the one that God chose to be the, the future leader of Israel. And, of course, that's what happened. <coughs> and it talks about that Jesus would be of that lineage. And certainly, 
he was. And I'll tell you the cool thing about that. If you go back to uh, 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 the, the two um, uh, of the New Testament, the two lineages of Christ, one goes through Mary, and it goes from the, from the uh, talks about through the lineage of David, uh, because that's the earthly aspect or connection with God. And then the, the, the male part of it that would be Joseph, it goes through all of his lineage, and it comes from David as well. Just in case that somebody said, well, Joseph's not really his daddy, you know, God's his daddy, so that's, that, that's no good. But, 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 but it is good because either way, um, it comes through the lineage of David. I just think that's cool. I don't know. I, that's, that's free. But um, <clears throat> I think it's cool. But when, when Isaiah reveals that a shoot would come up from that old dead stump, I'm going to tell you what, the, 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 the Jews were a dead bunch. They needed a Savior bad. I mean, all the way back, certainly from the time of Isaiah, but it might have been worse at the time when Christ was born because they had taken the, the commandments of God and just made them into shambles. They'd made them into earthly rules and regulations like you could work yourself, you could work your way to God. And that is so far from God's intention that he's came so that he might not only do away with all of that stuff, but also at the same time fulfill that great law of God. So anyway, in Luke chapter 2, verse 4, the Bible says, So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in, uh, to, uh, in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David or the city of David or of the lineage of David, because that's where Jesse and all of them lived uh, back in that day, because he belonged to the house and the lineage of of David. So again, that prophecy that it talks about that Jesus was going to be of the lineage of David uh, came true in every sense possible. God wanted to make sure because we're a skeptical bunch. Amen. If there's a way that we can be skeptical and we can try to prove something wrong, we'll do it. And so God left no stone unturned. He removed all doubt that it, that this prophecy was going to be fulfilled. Isn't that good? I don't know if y'all like that or not, but I'm going to tell you what, and that's not the normal kind of preaching I do, but I'm just going to tell you that I believe today that God's real. And God in his word just over and over and over again talks about how genuine that God is. So Isaiah gives us a sure sign. <clears throat> he points to a sent son. He ties this Messiah to David's throne as a shoot from a stump. And then finally, we see Jesus revealed as a suffering Savior. Guys, this is the part I, 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 man, I've hustled through this so I can get to this part right here. A suffering Savior. How many of you are sinners? Those that didn't raise their hand, you just lied, so you're a sinner too. <laughs> God always punishes sin. God always punishes sin. Say that with me. God always punishes sin. Okay? So if you've sinned, then what you deserve is punishment. I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm just telling you that's what the, God, that's what the Word of God says. And sin that we commit is punished, even one, in a place called hell, the lake of fire. That the devil and his angels and all of us that don't know Christ as our Savior are put. Right? It'd be nice if we could save ourselves. It'd be nice if we could do enough good things or that we could be saved. But let me tell you what would be nicer. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? We could work enough ways that we could get to God and we could get to heaven finally. Woo, I got through the 413 things that I was supposed to do. Now I'm going to heaven. That's nice. Let me tell you what's nicer. Somebody do it for us. Hmm. Somebody do it for us. Wouldn't it be nice if somebody loved us enough that they would take on all of our mess and make it a masterpiece? Wouldn't it be nice if somebody was willing to love us enough that they would do something for us? We were in this uh, concert last night, and there was this young lady named Teranda Green that gave her testimony about how her husband, uh, she was in her 20s, her husband that she loved so much, uh, started having problems health-wise, uh, had complete kidney uh, failure and shut down. She gave her husband one of her kidneys. Uh, that worked for about a year, and then he died. She said, man, I'm telling you what, I just went off the rails. Made some bad choices, bad decisions, did some bad stuff. But can I tell you what she told us that just brought tears to my eyes was that she said that God never gave up on me. 
And God kept coming after me and kept coming after me and kept coming. Can I just tell you, we do all this stuff wrong. And we sin and we sin and we sin. And God would be completely justified in saying, okay, Johnny, I've hung in there with you as long as I can. I'm done. But instead, this suffering Savior continued to come after me and continues to come after me now. Jesus came to earth to be our Redeemer so that by His suffering and ultimately, ultimately by um, sacrificing Himself on the cross is our substitute, by the way, we can be saved for our sins. So that, you know, I always heard it said, uh, if, if, you, if you know Jesus, you only have, you have two births and only one death. Think about that, right? If you don't know Jesus, you have one birth and you have two deaths. What do you mean? Well, if, if, if you know Christ, you were born physically and then again you were born spiritually. You have one death, you go to a heaven, you go to a place prepared specially by you, by God, amen? If you don't know God, you're, you're born once, then you die. You pick the order, but physically you die spiritually and you're placed into eternity of damnation. Pastor, I don't like you talk about that stuff. I don't like to hear about that stuff. Do we, do we, church, do we need to hear about that stuff? Listen, I'm not judging you. I'm not. It's only by the grace of God and only by a suffering Savior that I know Jesus in my heart. He said, well, what'd you do to get it? I did nothing. I called upon the name of the Lord. Just like it says in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, I called upon the Lord and he was, and he was faithful to his promise to save me. How do you know? Because my life changed. Matthew chapter 21, we'll get to Isaiah 53 here in a minute. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 21 says, She, Mary, will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. I mean, it kind of sounds like a Christmas sermon, but let's connect, let's, let's connect the dots back to Isaiah chapter 53, and we're going to see an amazing amount of pinpoint prophecies that describe this substitutionary atonement, that's what it's called, <coughs> of Christ on the cross. Isaiah chapter 53, uh, verse 3. Excuse me just a second. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> now, as you go down through here, just you don't have to lift them in the air, but just, just kind of count off on your fingers how many prophecies we see right here in, in, uh, in, in three verses. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom mid hide their faces people i mean peter denied him right he was despised and we esteemed him not surely verse four he took up our infirmities our sin load and carried our sorrows yet we considered him stricken by god smitten by him and afflicted that's what the people around him thought about christ when he on the cross verse 5 but he was pierced nails went through his hands and his feet sword went in his side he was pierced for our transgressions what are transgressions somebody say sin that's what transgressions are he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed does anybody like that <laughs> i mean i know that you know that don't ring bells or anything but if you know how bad you were and you consider that your only way to heaven was what happened right here all of a sudden you start thinking about christ in a different way I read a story about a man from China, a true story about a man, I, I think it is anyway, uh, uh, who was converted to Christ, and then later he told this story. He said this story. He said a man fell into a dark, slimy pit. He tried to climb out of the pit, but he couldn't. Confucius came along, saw the man, and said, poor fella, 
I wish he'd listened to me. He would have never gotten there. And he went on. Buddha came along and saw the man in the pit and said, Poor fella, if he'll come up here, I'll help him. And he too kept on walking. But then Jesus came along and said, Poor fella. And then he jumped into the pit and helped him out. <laughs> Isn't that what God did for us? When the world walked by us and said, Poor fella, Jesus jumped into the pit and glory to God brought me back out with him. Jesus came not only to be born into this world, but to be born into your heart. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 1, it says, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, here am I, here am I. Ah. Will you stand with me, please? God went to all that trouble for one reason. So that you and I might have eternal life and be reconciled to him. What does that reconciled mean? It means brought together. It means that the scales are balanced. It means that the books measure out. All of your sins, which were red like crimson, were made white as snow. Will you surrender your heart to him today? If you don't believe in Jesus after all of this, Father, I give you praise for today. Thank you, Lord, for running toward us when we run away from you. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just be heavy on the hearts of those that don't know you, Lord. Lord, it breaks my heart to know that people in this very room may very well die and go to hell because they haven't made one simple request. Lord, please come into my heart and save me because I hadn't made one simple statement. Lord, I surrender my life to you. Because they don't have one simple belief that you are real and you died for me. Lord, I pray if there's those here today, Lord, that feel like they're in darkness, for them to look up so they can see the light. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do in this time right now in Christ's name. Amen. You come